For those of you that like sports, I have a treat for you today. His name is Ryan Hammer, and he works with FanDuel, but he also does his other sports content on the side. And interestingly enough, FanDuel doesn't just do sports betting. They do other content as well. And for those of you who are trying to get into the sports industry or trying to break in, or, you know, you athletes out there who didn't make the league but still want to be around sports, he has some very valuable information make sure you check them out on instagram make sure you subscribe and if you're feeling nice there are some links down there that you would enjoy preferably the cash app love you on july 16th at the crossover he the atlanta hawks are playing nba street at the crossover pro am trey dribbles through the legs live it to dejounte who puts it off the glass for john collins to finish march 24th 2017 kentucky and ucla in the sweet 16 headlined by lonzo ball versus De'Aaron fox but this was the De'Aaron fox show he hits the game's first basket and really just never looked. which college team nickname is the least intimidating i got a good list because there are some surprising ones out there i don't think people fully understand how incredible of a recruit recruiter John Calipari is and has always been so here are some mine part two of trying to build the perfect college basketball projecting the best freshman in Pac-12 basketball for next season I'll mention to Trey White welcome back to another episode of important miscellaneous talks I'm your host glass for culture we are changing the world one podcast at a time our wonderful guests please introduce yourselves uh yeah what's up my name is Ryan Hammer first of all thanks for having me on um I don't know how to describe myself I'm a sports nerd basketball guy uh, I used to play soccer and stuff like that, but um, I'm a lover of all sports and all things. So, gotcha. What made you uh, interested in getting into the field that you're in? Um, I think just growing up in like the family and area I, I grew up in with, with two older brothers, like kind of being sucked into sports. Not that's a bad thing; it's a good thing for me. Um, but playing sports as a young young kid, like every sport possible, and watching every professional league, and then kind of just like having a, a really good understanding I think at a young age helped me really develop like good thinking for the future of the sports and stuff like that and basketball was kind of something that I've always taken a taken a liking to the most so how did you break into the field um that's a good question I don't even know if I've like I, I guess you want to say I've broken at this point that's tough but um there's always more to do is like one thing like I always think you know I I guess we want to say broken into, but there's always more I can break into and more I can keep doing and, and improving on and stuff and growing with. But uh, I, I think just like on social media, I kind of just took my chance. Basically, I just started doing things with zeros on my followers list and zero everywhere because like you got to start somewhere, as you know that. And um, I, I think just from there, I think what I was doing started to gain quality and I started to do better stuff and more consistent uh, consistency was a huge key over time. Just keep doing things and keep doing things until you really see what starts to work. So, so what are some of the best ways for someone to break into the sports field now? Uh, in the content world, I think it's, I think I always say that like niche niche is the best way to go where in sports world, where if you, like I started doing a little bit of everything, soccer, basketball, football, talking to whatever, just cause like it comes easy to me. It comes natural. I started to notice myself doing basketball more because it's what I know best. Uh, and then I started to realize that that's what people were coming to me for. So that's what I started to get into. And then more like college basketball and NBA draft and get even more granular and specific. And I think mm. if you can, if people can kind of pick out one specific aspect, right. Say it's, it is sports. Um, whether it, like there's someone on TikTok who's the receiver teacher. So in football, he only talks about wide receivers and he has a huge account because of that because people go to him strictly for wide receiver stuff because they know that he's the best out there. Got it. Do you have any other strategies for someone to break into the sports world that might not be in the content creation space? Yeah. Uh, the professional side, I also work, I have like a, I work nine to five, whatever, like full-time job in the professional side of sports world uh, or business corp or whatever. Um, I think that is a huge networking thing. Like, it sounds so cliche. It sounds very cliche, but it's, it's completely true. You have to know people. You have to meet as many people as you can go to events, like even like finding people on LinkedIn, talking to them, like getting coffee, whatever, stuff like that. Got you. So it's all about who, you know, it's a sad thing. It's a sad but, truth okay. to an extent. I'd say to an extent, like I didn't get my job knowing anybody. I happened to just like apply for jobs for a year. Finally got a chance to get my job. Got it. Um, but in the top end of things, like when you want to work for a team in a front office or you want to do like social media for a team, like it's not as easy as just like 
I'm going to be the one to get it because I deserve it. There's a thousand other people that probably are just as capable of it too. So why do you think, uh, why do you think it's so competitive? I, I always think this, like, I don't know, like people just love sports. Like it's so hard to describe mm-hmm. the people's, our like innate nature for loving this game, the games and sports that are like, are entertainment based. Like they were created as entertainment, but it's gotten to a point where it's become like a lifestyle thing. And that's a, that's a really good question. Cause like, it's honestly wild to think about how far sports have come and the world around, not even just the athletes and the people directly there, but there's so much more beyond it. I think, I think one reason may be that a lot of people like playing sports as well outside of just watching sports. So, mm-hmm. you know, being a professional athlete, it's, it's extremely hard and extremely yeah. difficult. And the likelihood of that happening is slim to none. Like, you might as well be playing a lot right. of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so for a lot of people, they figure, well, I can't be professional, but I, this is probably the best way for me to be around the sport and still have access to the same kind of access that a lot of athletes have. So that's a good point. Yeah. That might be a reason. Yeah. I, it's just, I, I find myself doing that a lot too. Or like, if you're a sports fan and you go to play pickup somewhere, you go to just like go by yourself and go throw around, kick around, shoot around, whatever, like, you find yourself doing things that you watch and you see, and like, you want to do things like that. And like you said, you want to be around that as much as you possibly can, even if you're not going to be on the court next to like LeBron, whatever it's, it's like you said, one person, it's a 1% of a 1% of a 1% of a 1% of a 1% kind of thing. So. Right. It's like, I might not be able to play with LeBron, but if I can interview LeBron, that's <laughs> cool. Like if I can get free tickets backstage, you know, or if I can sit courtside. Right. So exactly. It's a, it's, it's a dream. So, Work with FanDuel. What have you learned about sports betting? Uh, I've learned a lot. I've been doing, been working with FanDuel for over a little over two years now. Um, the content stuff has become more, growing more and more. It's like interesting. So I like turned 21 when sports betting, mo- sorry, mobile sports betting on your phone just became legal in New Jersey where I, where I live. And then I was going to college in Pennsylvania where the next year that Pennsylvania was the second state to to go live uh, for mobile sports betting. So I was like one of the first customers. And I was like, so I think being a customer from day one was able to help me understand it very, very vividly. And then going, moving over to like having a corporate side of things in there and like also content stuff, you see things that you kind of understand more, nothing that's going to like give you ways to easy, easy ways to win money. Um, but it's just cool to see how things work. Like I specifically like the trading side of things, the guys that make all the numbers, they do all the odds and they put everything on site and they're changing it every single second of the day. So I think that stuff is interesting. Got you. Got you. So a lot of your content creation, is that for FanDuel? Uh, The content, most of it is myself. Like I do, I've done everything myself. And then um, I was working with FanDuel corporately and then I started to do stuff content wise as well. Um, FanDuel content is awesome because like they reach everywhere. It's not just sports betting content. They do like everything sports, everything sports culture and stuff like that it could be the hot dog eating contest, like whatever they want to do. Uh, so it's, it's good to see the reach. It gives me opportunity to do my own stuff. And also when the time is right and when we're doing stuff together to do stuff for them. Okay. So when, when, when you travel and, and cover a game and things like that, that's, that's for you. It depends. It's very, okay. uh, it, it just, it's like, we were, I was at summer league, NBA summer league, uh, a couple weeks ago for a good, like for too long in Vegas, I can only like five, six hot, days. In Vegas. Yeah, it was like 120 degrees. Uh, but I was there with Vandal. We had like a small team out there doing some content stuff. Um, same with like March madness. They sent me out there, but then a couple other things, like I went to like a Knicks and Nets game. That's really close to me. Uh, go to like a Hawks game, my team and stuff like that. And that sometimes it's, it's all on me. So it just depends on what it is. So for someone trying to break into the sports betting industry, what are some things that you suggest that they do? Definitely understand the business side of things in the sense that like follow what states allow it and what states don't follow. Like there's public market share reports and things. You can see what companies are leading in what states are there differences across states. Like what, and then you can look at like month by month and year by year to see who is taking the leap, who's fallen the new brands, the old brands and see who's kind of the big dogs. Like there are public reports that like Darren Ravel is a good example. He's a weird guy, but um, he publishes stuff on Twitter all the time, like public reports of all the stuff for easy access. And I think that's a great way for people on the outside to understand the business. So that going in, if they want to work in sports betting world, they can be like, I already know all this stuff and how the landscape is. So it helps me transition. 
You mentioned that FanDuel does more than just sports betting content. So what are some ways that uh, someone can utilize FanDuel outside of just sports betting? Um, relative to the content stuff, I think like just like any other sports brand kind of on social media, you see like ESPN, Overtime, Bleacher Report, they all have different stuff that like really go after. But I think FanDuel is very... Um, very keen on a lot of the video content, the video platforms, YouTube, some, they have like, we have live shows and stuff like that. TikTok. Um, I think when you come, they have sportsbook account and they have a FanDuel account also for every single social media platform. So you have two complete different, completely different avenues that kind of mesh together. What do you love the most about your job? Um, probably back to what we were saying before earlier. Like I like, it can get cliche at times to look at like sports betting numbers and just sports in general sometimes, but um, being, being, being able to have my job, make a living like around sports was always my goal from a young age when I realized I wasn't probably going to be a professional athlete. Like you said, like you kind of still want to be in there. Um, so being able to say like, I can make a living off of um, being in the sports world and still interact and stuff like that is, is a, uh, is a big part. Who's, who's your team in basketball? I'm a I'm an Atlanta Hawks fan. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So what, what do you what do you think about them moving forward? I think I think we've had a good young core. I love our addition of DeJounte Murray in the offseason. We didn't get him for anything too expensive. It was like Gallinari and three first rounders. Trey and DeJounte is gonna be really good. We have an interesting situation with John Collins if we're gonna trade him or not at this point. I don't know if we are. Our core is good. We won't be able to win a title with this team this year or probably next year, but maybe in the coming years. Um, I don't know. I just think we have a ceiling that's before the title, which is sad to think about, but I do think the team could definitely get back to the Eastern Conference Finals. It's a good dark horse team, uh, and it's a fun team too. Like We have stars, but we don't have KD, Kyrie, Harden, and be like the superstars, which – you obviously want on your team, but it almost makes it more fun being a dark horse sometimes because my teams never win. Every single team I like, they never win anything. So it's, it's okay. Well, what are some of your other favorite teams? Uh, so I'm from New Jersey. New Jersey my, my dad's from New York. Uh, so the Hawks thing is a whole other story, but I am a New York Jets fan, a New York Mets fan, a Rangers fan, and a Maryland basketball fan. Oh, Maryland. I'm a Mets fan as well. How are yeah. is baseball one of your favorite sports? Uh, it's one of it's one of my not it's one of my lower least favorite sports out of like the guy the teams I like I like I say I'm a Mets fan before I'm a baseball fan so okay yeah okay. yeah with baseball is weird because they they have a a strong following locally but yes. not nationally exactly that's interesting you would, that's a it's a it's a weird thing about baseball it's not a dying sport at all but the overall market of it is has like Rob Manfred and the MLB front office have done a pretty bad job with marketing the product to the young generation and like nationally and even internationally, whereas sports like even the NFL are marketing across to the UK and internationally. And the NBA has always been an international sport, but that's like causing other sports to really take strides ahead of the MLB. And even leagues like the MLS are going to sneak up on the MLB in the near future. So, oh, wow. Wow. I, I, think, I, think, I think they've been doing a better job in recent and recent years mm -hmm. MLB. Like they're just now starting to pick up some steam with marketing their players better, but yeah. still like the Dodgers and Yankees, they're probably the two most notable national yeah. uh, names. Like they, like no matter where the Yankees go, like they, 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 they sell tickets. Show yeah. me sells tickets as well. But everywhere I, you go in the world, you can see a Yankees hat, I swear. Like, and people don't even like know what it is or don't care about it. Like you see a Navy blue Yankee hat everywhere in the world. It's actually crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Um, but I think like Mike Trout is a good example for this. Like I always say this where Mike Trout should be like known by everybody, not, not like LeBron and stuff like that, but he should be as known as Jokic and Embiid in the NBA. He should be as known as Josh Allen in the NFL, but he's not like by all these people because Mike Trout is that good but he's not in the market where you want him to be early on the team. Maybe the market is there, but yeah. the team where you want him to be. And I don't think like things like that are a great example of where ways that they can easily improve. Yeah. I've been watching the, the Derek Jeter do documentary mm. and it really makes you wonder if Derek Jeter would be nearly this popular. If you never play yeah. for the Yankees, right. Play for the twins or the <laughs> Diamondbacks or the Rays, who knows if, because he was, he was expected to get drafted to the Reds. I forgot the other team. 
He was expected to go one or five. The Reds had the fifth pick. Mm. The Yankees had the sixth pick. So he was expected to go to one of those places. So if he went to one of those places, man, man, a lot of people say Derek Jeter is like the most overrated player of all time now. I have seen that. I was like, like I, I don't know enough of every single intricacy and like number to go in depth of that, but I've seen a lot of cases for that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's fair because while I love numbers, <laughs> <laughs> the eye test shows that he yeah. was a good player. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate like guys who are like clear Hall of Famers. Like it's hard to hate on that much, but you know how it works. If people hate on everybody, every single athlete, MJ, LeBron, all the way to Tom Brady, whatever. Like people are gonna hate on everybody. Definitely. Do Do you think the Hawks should trade uh, John Collins? I don't think they should, but they have to at this point because mm. what they've done. They they were so public about wanting to trade him and actively trying to trade him that it got it has gotten to a point where like if I was him I wouldn't want to go come back and be like you look at what you guys did like you've tarnished my name so bad and he wants a bigger role like that's what he's always wanted and he's not going to get it anymore cuz now they've added DeJounte another handler and it's going to be even tougher for him to get the touches that he wants but I think he's an incredible player and like on the court I I want him to stay but I don't blame him for probably wanting to leave at this point so top 5 all time in NBA history NBA history Mm -hmm. Uh, I st LeBron at one, MJ at two. Oh, whoa! Oh, always, oh, I, yeah, that's an easy one for me. Why well, came out the gates hot? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, to me like it's easy to start at one and two because you know, like, unless you want to go absolutely insane, like those are one and two. Whatever people put different order, but um, those are always one and two to me. <clears throat> and I always like I always struggle with read it with past there. Like I really always struggle with that. I always have Magic in my top five at some point. I think. He's pretty underappreciated. People talk about him versus Curry, best point guard ever. But, like, what Magic did coming into the league in, like, his rookie year, from day one coming into the league and what he's done. And I, and he's, like, the first of, like, the big guards. And you look at, like, guys like Luka and stuff like that. Like, wow. they would still be good. But Magic was the first of that kind. So, I appreciate Magic. I'd probably be Magic at three, to be honest. Okay. Um, four and, See, like, then I go to four and five and, like, ah. Uh, See, a lot of the modern guys, like, it's not – I don't have Kobe in my top five. don't have Tim Duncan in my top five. I love Shaq, actually. I think Shaq is actually close. Um, but guys like Kareem are probably up there and maybe, like, Larry Bird or something like that. Wow. The disrespect that Kareem gets is so outrageous. Yeah. Man. His basketball resume is so impeccable, damn near flawless. And people just throw him in there like, yeah, maybe he is, maybe he is. I've seen Kareem off of top five lists. And Kareem has a, a legit argument to be the best player ever. He's got to be top. Yeah, he does have to be top five. If you like, if you look at it on paper, especially, which is every how we have to do it with guys from different generations. He like, it's hard, like you said, it's hard not to put him on there. So people probably, I've seen people put him like to the back end of 10 and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, I've seen kind of like crazy. seven, eight. I'm like, what? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So recently we've been hearing a lot about that. I've mentioned to the Knicks. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that's a trade the Knicks should be pursuing? I think the asking price is far too high. I, I heard Danny Ainge looking for a seven first round <laughs> for Donovan Mitchell. I heard the last I heard was he wanted out of these four, he wanted three of the following four guys like Obi, Miles McBride, Emmanuel Quickly, and Cam Reddish. He wanted three of those guys, and I think it was five or six first, or like six first. That's way too much. I also know that like. What's up? Way too much. Yeah, it's it's insane. Like, because of what he was able to get for Rudy, he's like, oh, like, I'm going to get everything for Donovan then. And like, it, to be fair from him, like, he should be doing that. And they don't need to trade Donovan because he's 24. So they have years left. They have five, six years left on him if they can keep him around and keep him happy, obviously. But they can build a young core around him and, like, do a rebuild with him. And it'll be a quicker rebuild because you have him to build around it's it's hard to convince him to stay, but for the Knicks perspective, I think if they make the trade, right? Say they have Brunson and Donovan. First of all, that backcourt will never win win enough. It's two six one guys. It's just never going to succeed in the NBA. I, like I hate as a Trey Young stan, I hate to say that, and I wanted Donovan on the Hawks, but like Donovan and Brunson maybe take them to the playoffs at best with RJ and Mitchell Robinson. Like maybe Julius, they have him, but like. That's not a core that's going that's going to win a playoff series. There's just no way. Wow, that's brutal. Wow. Yeah. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm being brutally honest. I've seen a lot of Knicks talk. Like, people I know, I'm in the area, are Knicks fans, and they're like, oh, like, 
they're going to be better than they're going to be a top four or five team in the East. I'm like, there's literally no chance. They have zero chance of being that this year. The delusion that Knicks fans have, I'm I'm born and raised in Queens, so grew up around. I'm a Lakers fan because of Kobe. I hate LeBron. Yeah. I <laughs> I grew up around so many Knicks fans, and year after year is delusion after delusion after delusion. When they got Derrick Rose, the amount of <laughs> conference finals talk I heard was astronomical. Yeah, it's Knicks fans are different. Something. I like to call it passion to like be respectful to them because like. I always say that the Knicks are New York's team. Like if the Knicks, yeah. if every single team won a title in New York in the same year, the Knicks would be the most highly regarded and like the most cared about. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. I get most celebrated. Yeah. Most celebrated. Yankee, Probably. Yankees yeah. maybe too. Yankees yeah. maybe. It would just be another would be title called, for the Yankees. But the Yankees were more accustomed to them winning. So yeah, right. Exactly. Maybe, maybe it would be the Knicks. Yeah, honestly, it would it would be the Knicks. I would like to see them win too, but I just want them to be more realistic. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, I, I like don't hate the idea of them winning. Cause like the i the idea of what they've gone through in their fan base and like their team being bad, bad for years. Mm -hmm. But then I think about all the people I know, and I'm like, I would never hear the end of it if the Knicks won. Yeah, them. literally, literally, and, and you know, and, and the Knicks fans they hold on. Like, so we're going to hear about this five, six, seven, eight years. Because I still hear talks about how they went to the 99 finals. <laughs> I hear about how they went to the 94 finals. From the good old days with Melo. Uh, I still hear a lot about it. So if they, if they somehow end up winning a championship. Honestly, I'm not sure how likely a championship is with James Dolan still there. Yeah, they're not going to win a title. Even Yeah, with Dolan for sure. And even the roster, though, like, they're never going to win a title when I think these guys can be good. Like their core being quickly Barrett, um, Quentin Grimes, like McBride, like Obi, like they're never gonna win a title with these guys. They're gonna need one, if not two, two superstars to come into New York. And that's what every team in the NBA needs. Like if you could look every single team, you add two superstars, they'd be a title contender. And like the Knicks are one of those teams. <laughs> Maybe not the Kings, but yeah. That's true. The Kings are decent. I feel like their their roster gets a little too uh I feel bad for them, but Talk about feeling bad for fans. I feel bad for Kings fans. But their roster now is, like, actually decent and could be, like, a dark horse playoff team this year. Got you. I would not give up. The most first-round picks I would give up for Mitchell is four. Uh, he hasn't even made an all-NBA team. Yeah, not yet. He hasn't. He – yeah, I, I think – I'm a Donovan fan, so I think that he's, like, just behind Booker at this point. Maybe there. He's like at Zach Levine's level. He is up there, like, a top 15 player in the NBA. And I think he's worth if I think he's worth it for the right team. So I couldn't think of the, like the, say the Celtics didn't trade for Brogdon and they wanted to get Donovan. Like it would have made perfect sense to go get Donovan to pair with Tatum and the rest of their core and stuff like that. Cause that's a title moving piece. Like that puts yeah. them over the line. I, I, I like, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. But like that's it. out the window now. So Nuggets too, if he was to go to the Nuggets, I think that would be nice. Nuggets would be solid. But, right. There are a few teams where like, they need someone, and then they are there. Like, it, the Bucks don't make a lot of sense because they have what they have, and they're going to be a title contender no matter what. But, like, Donovan and Drew next to each other, if they could somehow pull that off, it'd be great, but there's, they're not going to be able to do what they can. But Miami. I like there. Miami, too. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty – that's the one that I was on, like, maybe a couple months ago. I, I tweeted at him in a, in a heat jersey. I was like, this is going to happen 100%. Like they have the most young, they have the best balance of being good and needing him. And then also having young guys and some picks or enough assets to get it done. Like between hero, Duncan Robinson, Max Struess, like they can, like even a like Gabe Vince or whatever, they can throw in a good amount of these guys and a few picks and like they can get it done. So. So describe your daily routine for a game day. Uh, for like, a, for like any game or like a Hawks game you're saying. For games that you have to report on. Oh, that I'm at. Um, it depends if I'm if I'm traveling like far, if I'm driving, flying, whatever. But when I'm at the location, a little drive away, um, in the morning I like to like gear up a lot of uh, a lot of like thoughts in my head and like and understand everything, understand going into the game, the implications and stuff like that. Every single player that's going to be on the floor, maybe some like statistical profiles also. Just so like I don't do like formal reporting, like live tweeting the games and like. I don't do a cr crazy amount of stuff like that, but I will do like video content around it, be there to tell people about it after, like try to get some highlights and like interview fans and talk to people. But I think 
doing, getting myself geared up mentally to like, make sure I'm not going to miss anything and not, and not, not understand anything is a big part. Um, and then also I love, love to get to, I love to get to arena early. I love to walk around when there's less people there and like get down to the court and stuff like that. Um, try to meet some of the guys if I can see them, but it, it also depends what kind of access I have. But from there, I, I like to just soak in the game after that. Got you. And my final question, your thoughts on Chet Hol Holmgren. <laughs> it's tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. uh, Chet's awesome. Chet is very, very awesome. He is pretty one of a kind with what he can do. Like he's a center, but he's a point guard. He's pretty positionless. He is like, I, there's a small group of guys in the NBA I categorize as Swiss Army Knives, guys, knives, I guess, Swiss Army Knives, that can do a little bit of everything. Chet really doesn't have many weaknesses in his game. People say like, ah, his body, his frame, like, right. But you, you think he is weakness is his frame by looking at him, not by watching him play, because he does a very, very good job at being smart to absorb contact, use his length over tall defenders and true centers and stuff like that. Is he going to be able to defend Embiid and Giannis? No, nobody can. Nobody can defend them. So he's not going to have to on day one. Um, over time, he'll start to understand more, grow into his frame, and really be able to like defend those guys well, better than most people in the NBA. But I legitimately think Chet, like he his floor is very very high. People think it's low because of his how he's built, but it's very very high. He knock on wood does not have injury issues yet. Um, I'm hoping he never experiences that, but I think that he is he'll definitely be like an all-star down the line, potential like defensive player of the year. Like he could be an MVP one day and I wouldn't, wouldn't doubt that at all. So you think, you think is his peak will be MVP. You can build a franchise, a championship level team around him. A hundred percent. I think, especially with how easy he is to play off ball, on ball, whatever you need him to do. That's why the thunder core is so great. Cause like they have their guards, they have Josh Giddy, they have SGA is a scoring guard. Josh Giddy is a passing guard. Trey man's a great six man. They just drafted Jalen Williams in the lottery also, who's a great like wing secondary handler scorer and stuff like that. And I think Chet can be slotted into any team because he doesn't need the ball in his hands to be effective. Great pick and roll threat, great lob threat. He can shoot off the ball, the catch and shoot. And if you need him to handle, he can, and he can take bigs out of the paint and really go to work on them. So I think he is a piece you can build around hundred percent. I never, well, I get it to some degree, but I never really understood why so many people criticize an 18 year old how old is he he i think he's he's 19 now like like a yeah. 19, 18 year old coming into the league and talk about his frame like bro like you don't think you just stay like that forever like <laughs> he had a similar frame lonzo had a right. similar frame Giannis, and they, they all got bigger even lebron although like lebron came with more frame but lebron no i still i like, yeah nowhere near as big as he is now and act like the nba doesn't have nutritionists dietitians a whole medical staff the best in the world yeah Literally, literally, like they, they're going to watch what he eats. They're going to get him in a weight room. They're going to put him in a program to make sure that he builds muscle. Like, why do you think a 19 year old is going to come in like Shaq every year? <laughs> you're, pre you're preaching to the choir right now because people like will go to his. I think the more college basketball has gotten popular and the more social media helps grow things like you see small clips like he had dunked on one time and like people just like blow things out of proportion at a young age. And to be fair with young guys in the NBA, like the leash has gotten shorter over time. So like if guys are 21 or 18 coming into the league, some people don't, most people don't care. And they're and in, within two years, if they're not playing well, people will throw them out the window and they're like, you know what? They're not going to be good because they haven't been good in the first year or two. And I think that's why the older prospects have gotten more love recently because the older prospects are more experienced and they're more built and they're ready to go more. Uh, that's like kind of what Keegan Murray is for the Kings this year. It's what Chris Duarte was last year he's 25 he's going to be in his second year in the nba and he's 25 already like he was always going to be good day one um but i think the, sh the leash is shorter but over time guys like chet and everybody who's going to be very very good in the elite like they'll they will play out how they need to i agree thank you so much for coming on to the podcast thank you so much for taking your time out to speak of course uh god bless you <laughs> and you i appreciate you having me on no problem